Our journey begins here, in this small town home, nestled in the mountains, with a family who has never allowed TV cameras in before. And you're going to soon learn why. This is so pretty out here. Yeah. They live in Colorado, one of two states where it's legal to smoke pot medically and recreationally. But here, it's also taboo to residents like Paige Figgy and her husband, Matt. I'm sure it was mentioned to us by someone, hey, you should try this. And, and I thought, no way. He thought that's fringe stuff. No way, that's... not in a million years. But none of this is for Matt. He's a military man, and marijuana would be a career ender. I grew up in Wisconsin in a well-loving family, and I was educated that, like, oh, that's a drug. You don't do that. And I never did. But just decades ago, marijuana was a legitimate medication, also called cannabis, prescribed by doctors and dispensed by pharmacies. Away. This is Harry J. But that all changed in 1930. Relentless warfare against Henry Ainslinger, the United States' first drug czar. For him, public enemy number one. You guessed it, marijuana. This guy saw how he could increase the budget of his uh, department uh, by having this mission, going at the marijuana. You know, saying that there's this drug that the Mexican migrant workers are smoking and it's loco weed and it's going to make them crazy and they're going to rape your women. He got the anti-marijuana message out through news reports. And then came this. It is convinced that he is hopelessly and curably in Spain. The film, Reefer Madness portraying the users of marijuana as unproductive, crazed. People are still afraid of what pot can do to them. In many ways, uh, to have defined our attitudes now for 70 years. Yeah. Marijuana then became illegal in 1937. And by 1970, it was a Schedule I controlled substance. The government was saying it had no medicinal value and had a high potential for abuse. All reasons why the figgy stayed away from marijuana until this and this might be hard for some of you to watch uh. it's okay baby this is their daughter charlotte having a seizure we just thought it was just one random febrile seizure nothing to really do right. no medications it's a fluke right a fluke made sense. After all, Charlotte, nicknamed Charlie, was born perfectly healthy, a fraternal twin to Sister Chase. Charlie always had big, big smiles. Just happy kids. Easy. I mean, yeah, yeah, easy. Very much so. So it was around three months, uh, you said, that when you yeah. first noticed that yeah. Charlie had a seizure. I was changing her diaper, well, putting a new diaper on from after the bath, and her eyes just started flickering. It led to the first of many trips to the ER. They did the million dollar workup, the MRI, EEG, spinal tap, you know, they did the whole workup and found nothing and sent us home. No abnormal blood tests, no abnormal scan. And developing normally too, you know, talking and walking and the same day as her twin. Nothing was behind yet. By the time she was two though, the seizures had become constant and started to take their toll on their once happy joyful little girl. She started to really decline cognitively and she was slipping away and she just wasn't keeping up with her twin. The Figgies finally found an answer. It was awful news. Dravet syndrome. It is severe intractable epilepsy. The seizures start during the first year of life and are unstoppable, difficult to control and very damaging. Severe behavioral problems, attention deficit, and hyperactivity, the self-injury, you know, banging her head on the floor and pulling her hair out and like a possessed child. This isn't your perfect, happy Charlotte. It was a race against time. Many Dravet kids die young in early childhood. Charlotte was almost three. For the next two years, the Figgies tried everything. Strange diets, acupuncture and dozens of powerful drugs like Valium, Ativan, phenobarbital, but nothing seemed to help. Even worse, some of the medications nearly killed her. After one dose, she stops breathing, and after two doses, her heart will stop. Did you have to do CPR then on her yourself? Yes. I remember when her heart stopped and I had her pulse, and I lost her pulse, there was just nothing. The ambulance is on its way. She survived. Mm. You're okay. Mommy's here. 
But now it was fall of 2011, and Charlotte was five years old. When things were at their worst, she just sees all night, and the kids are sleeping either in my room or next to her. They can hear her the seizure scream all night, 50 times a night. And Chase would come in in the morning and just... This is her twin, <laughs> and just hug her and like rub her head and say, I'm, I'm just so glad you survived through the night last night. Matt had been deployed to Afghanistan, and the only thing he could do to help was start scouring the internet. And he stumbled onto this video of a child using marijuana. So how's everything go? Jean had four days without a seizure. I'm like, wow, this having success on specifically Dravet, this is interesting, it's natural. And while he couldn't ever imagine taking marijuana himself, he was now in the stunning position of recommending it for Charlotte. I was like, we need to do this. And I said, I don't know. Charlie, there you are. And then Charlotte's condition got worse. 300 seizures a week, almost two every hour. She was not talking or moving basically catatonic. As a last resort, doctors wanted to either prescribe a powerful veterinary drug used on epileptic dogs or put Charlotte in a medically induced coma so her brain and body could rest. For Paige, those were not good options. But maybe, just maybe, marijuana now was. But she was about to find out how hard that would be. And this isn't go to the pharmacy and yeah. pick up your medicine. There was no protocol. When we come back, what will the figgies do? And what would you do if this were your daughter? I had resigned myself. I don't think she's going to survive this. We've seen her flatline in the hospital. We've said goodbye. You're listening to Matt and Paige Figgy describe their own daughter. What would you do if this were your child? Charlotte Figgy had an extreme form of epilepsy. Her body was so frail that any seizure could kill her. With no traditional treatment left to try and the clock ticking away, her parents decided to try marijuana. Charlotte was just five years old. You need a card in order mm -hmm. to be able to get the cannabis from a pharmacy. Doctors have to prescribe it. You need two doctors in Colorado uh, to get the card for a, a juvenile or a child. It was hard. We were the first young child, and they said no. Everyone said no, 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 no. Certainly her age played a, played a role in, in my hesitance. Dr. Alan Shackelford is a Harvard-trained physician. He's also among a handful of doctors in Colorado who give prescriptions for medical marijuana. From the moment Charlotte entered his office, he knew she was in trouble. While he was just examining her, she had two seizures. She'd failed everything. Uh, there were no more options for her. Everything had been tried, except cannabis. Here's how scientists think it might work. Marijuana is made up of two ingredients. THC, that's the psychoactive part that makes you high, and CBD, also called cannabidiol. It's the CBD that scientists think modulates electrical and chemical activity to help quiet the excessive activity in the brain that causes seizures. I've been telling my patients to cut. Dr. Julie Holland is the editor of The Pot Book, a complete guide to cannabis. For a long time, the work on cannabis and epilepsy was sort of inconclusive. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. They couldn't quite figure it out. And it's only when they really started separating THC from CBD that they saw, you know, definitively, yes, CBD seems to really stop seizures. So the figgies needed to find something that was rare, a strain of marijuana that was low in THC. Of course, they didn't want Charlotte getting stoned, but also high in CBD to treat her seizures. And that wouldn't be easy. Dispensaries and growers, they make their money off strains that are high in THC. I'm Joel. I'm Josh. No one knows that better than the Stanley brothers. Their family business is pot. And if you look at these clean-cut guys and what you see surprises you, don't worry. They've heard it all before. When we round the corner, they're like, oh, wait a second. You know, did you finish high school? <laughs> they all not only finished high school, but also college, and in some cases, graduate school. Now, they are some of Colorado's biggest growers and dispensary owners. They produce up to 600 pounds of medical marijuana a year. And much of that marijuana is high in THC. But here, 
on their remote farm at this undisclosed location in the mountains. It takes a lot of plants. We're, we're allowed to grow six per patient. They have been growing something different, something they call revolutionary. So Greenhouse One. Greenhouse One, yes, welcome to it. Welcome wow. to paradise. Behind closed doors and under tight security, we enter what the Stanleys call the Garden of Eden. There's nothing like this in the world. This plant's 21% CBD and less than 1% THC. It took years of crossbreeding plants to get to this point. Instead of breeding up the THC, we've bred down the THC and bred up the CBD. And people said, you're crazy. You know, who's going to smoke that? So why grow it then? Well, the Stanleys also believed in CBD's potential to treat many diseases. And they had seen it change lives before. I always have two strains. I Meet 19-year-old Chaz Moore. He uses many different strains of marijuana, many of them high in CBD, to treat his rare disorder of the diaphragm. My abs. He can't catch his breath. It's called myoclonus diaphragmatic flutter. This fluttering here, it's annoying, and it, but it becomes painful yeah. um, well, pretty quickly, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, after like 15, 20 minutes, this is where I can like start to really feel. He's about to show me how the marijuana works. He's been convulsing now for seven minutes. How quickly do you expect this to work? Within like the first five minutes. And I'm done. Like, that's it. That's it. It was actually less than a minute. Depending on the attack in the day, like, it'll work within the first couple hits. Hear how his voice is completely different. That attack lasted eight minutes. But some have lasted much longer and happen as often as 40 times a day. And like Charlotte, he had tried so many things before. By 16, Chaz was taking these powerful, addictive, potentially deadly narcotics and muscle relaxants daily, like Valium and morphine. It would be safe to say that that marijuana, what you have in your hand there, is better than all those pills for you in terms of treating what's yeah, going on? Yeah, I wouldn't, I'm not zombified. I've had 16, 17 attacks today, and I'm still sitting up talking to you. My first attack on all these, I'd be in the hospital. I'm a firm believer that marijuana has actually saved my son's life. Chaz's father, Sean. His uh, quality of life now is a thousand times better than what it was when he was on the pharmaceuticals. A quality of life that Paige Figgy desperately wanted for her daughter Charlotte. But she still had one hurdle to cross. Convincing dispensary owners like the Stanleys to sell marijuana to a five-year-old little girl. When Charlotte's mother called my brother Joel and the brothers had a meeting he said tell us about this patient she's five years old he said and we said oh, no we can't do that why it was the fear of the unknown Charlotte was the youngest patient at the time wanting marijuana would it be too much for her or would it change her life forever we'll find that out later but first learn more about what marijuana does to your kids brain and yours as well April 20th, Denver, Colorado. Tens of thousands from around the country and the world lighting up legally. Happy Cannabis Cup, y'all. For some, it's a lifestyle. For others, it's a lifeline. We're working with the Lupus Foundation and rheumatoid arthritis. But for all of them, I wonder, what was it doing to their brains? Some of my patients call me pot doc. Your patients call you pot doc? Well, they never meet anybody who's as interested in hearing about their marijuana use as I am. Dr. Stacy Gruber is serious about pot. I want you to name the color and not to read it. Okay. I met her in her labs at McLean Hospital near Boston. She's using high-tech imaging to see what happens in the brain when you smoke. When you first smoke, that is, you know, you light up a joint, the spliff, a blunt receptors, which are throughout the brain, um, respond. And these areas of the brain are responsible for things like pleasure, memory, learning, sensation, uh, sense of time and space, coordination, movement, appetite, and other drives, shall we say. So it's sort of um, an all-over impact, right? So re reward, pleasure, hunger, 
um, you, you have this, this overall feeling of, of well-being, they say. That all sounds pretty good. <laughs> it does sound pretty good. And it's not just feeling good, but there's this phenomenon reported by many smokers over the years, especially famous artists, the ability to be more creative. When you feel that high, there's sort of a release of dopamine, and your brain sort of has the ability now to perceive things slightly differently from the way you might have if you hadn't been smoking pot. What you really see is this reduction in inhibitory function. Uh, welcome, Dr. Gupta. Pretty spectacular. Less inhibition. That's something that painter Amir says helps him be more creative. A successful artist, his canvases sell for up to $25,000. It's my favorite way to work. So, you think marijuana? Yeah. He's been painting for 14 years, smoking for even longer. He says it makes him feel more relaxed, but most importantly for him, he says it makes him less critical of his own work. Stop worrying so much about this and that and just sort of looking and being as, as present as possible. Amir does caution that it's a delicate balance for him. It would make me very apprehensive as maybe a little paranoid, just too analytical. You can get paranoid, you can have disorganized thinking, you get disoriented. Um, it can be uncomfortable, it can lead to panic attacks or anxiety attacks in people. How do you know when you've done too much? Uh, simple tasks become very frustrating, like mixing paint, and then just sort of get into this state of, uh, you know. <laughs> Good nail. And why that happens is exactly what Columbia University neuroscientist Carl Hart is investigating. Exhale. Research subjects in his lab smoke marijuana and then take a variety of cognitive tests. The effects will be disruption in memory, disruptions in inhibitory control. They will become slower at cognitive functioning, a wide range of things. These effects are temporary, but they're pretty pronounced and they are clear. And it's slowly becoming clear to scientists what part of the brain is most affected. It's the prefrontal cortex. It's very important for planning, uh, thinking, coordinating your behaviors. There are tons of marijuana receptors in this region. And we think that marijuana, particularly in the novice, can disrupt all of those uh, behaviors. An impairment that heart cautions could be dangerous, especially when driving. You may prematurely hit your brakes. You may prematurely hit the gas pedal, a wide range of things. You may uh, make a turn without looking more carefully. Look at this experiment done by CNN affiliate KIRO in Washington State. Subjects smoked marijuana and then drove. One was a daily medical marijuana smoker and another an infrequent weekend smoker. Relaxed and buzzed. The more the novice user smoked, the more trouble behind the wheel. Watch yourself, watch yourself. But interestingly, the habitual smoker didn't have as much trouble. I wouldn't pull her off the road, though. No. Well, not yet. And that's something I witnessed firsthand driving around with 19-year-old Chaz Moore. The day that I spent with him, he had been smoking all day long. Do you feel impaired at all? No, I don't. I feel normal. It turns out when you test people who have a lot of experience with cannabis, you don't see m many disruptions. But if you test people who have a, a sort of a limited history with cannabis, you can see some clear, pronounced disruptions. Of course, no one thinks that driving when using marijuana is a good idea. But what scientists can't answer is if there is a safe legal limit. And if people who use marijuana daily as a medicine should be able to drive. How impaired are they? What is more clear, though, is the effect of marijuana on the young brain. What we see is a very big difference in people who begin to smoke prior to the age of 16 and those who smoke after age 16, what we call early versus later onset. Gruber's brain scans show that the white matter, those are the highways that help the brain communicate from one point to another, are impaired in those who start smoking early. But maybe there's underlying white matter connectivity differences. That, that's, your, that's your concern, it sounds like, that the, those highways, those white matter highways, 
are just more disrupted in people who start smoking early. That's, that's what we see. Perhaps not surprising, given what we know about the young developing brain. That's a very delicate time in brain development, and that's not a good time to be taking any drugs. Preliminary research shows that early onset smokers are slower at tasks, have lower IQs later in life, higher risk of strokes, and increased incidence of psychotic disorders. And while these studies are not conclusive, some scientists are still concerned because in 2012, 35% of high school seniors lit up. And that could mean a generation of kids with damaged brains. And many fear something else. I never really told myself I needed help. A generation of marijuana addicts. When we come back, the truth and the science behind what's being called a growing epidemic. And later, Charlotte's story. The first and youngest child to try marijuana in Colorado. This was the day Chaz Moore almost died. Pumped full of drugs like morphine, dilaudid, Valium, to quiet a non-stop 48-hour attack. They thought I was going to overdose, and yeah, it was pretty bad. At his bedside, his father, Sean, watched his son go from being catatonic to what he calls high as a kite. How high are you on the morphine? I'm not, I'm not high. <laughs> well, I've watched friends of mine die from taking the same drugs that he took. You see, Sean was a drug addict, and he had struggled for decades to get clean. It was scary. It was really important for him not to take these drugs if he could avoid them. If he could avoid them. I know how addictive they are. I've seen it. It scared the hell out of me. But Sean is not scared of marijuana, and neither is Chaz. This right here, I don't get sick off of it. I can't overdose. And Chaz is right about that. While there are fatal, accidental prescription medicine overdoses every 19 minutes in this country, there are virtually no reports of fatal marijuana overdoses. And it's perhaps one of the biggest reasons most people think pot is safe. In fact, a new study of children showed that by high school, only one in five think marijuana is harmful. That's the lowest number in more than two decades. And it's something we heard over and over as we traveled around the country. Not really that harmful. It has a lot of benefits. Not really too concerned about it. I think it's safe if you're a safe person. Probiotics are But the experts we spoke to said there is more to the story. There are people who compulsively smoke, who want to stop smoking, but they can't stop smoking. In fact, 9% of marijuana users will become dependent. Now that's not as high as other drugs, like heroin. 23% of users become addicted, or 17% with cocaine, or 15% with alcohol. But it's still approximately one out of every 11 marijuana smokers. There's no longer any scientific debate that marijuana is not just psychologically addictive, but also physically addictive. So give me an update, how you doing? Dr. Christian Thurstone runs one of Colorado's largest youth substance abuse treatment clinics. The number of marijuana addicts he treats has tripled in the last three years alone. Literally, I cried about it. Marijuana is number one on their list of priorities. They have dropped out of life. Back in the day, I wouldn't feel like my day has really started if I didn't get high. Joel Vargas started smoking when he was just 13. By 15, he was smoking more than a dozen times a day. He stopped skateboarding. He even dropped out of school. I like getting high. I need to get high because my brain is telling me. Adolescents, starting at about age 13, have a pretty mature brain reward center. So they can experience rewards and pleasures the same way adults can. But the problem with that is that their prefrontal cortex, which helps people think ahead, um,